Kit, thanks for joining us. Hi, Rory. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. No worries. Do you want to just start off and like tell us a little bit about how, like, how you grew up, where you grew up, what your childhood was like, and how you got into filmmaking? I live in London now, but I grew up. I, I was born in London, and then my parents moved to the countryside when I was about ugh, three, four, five. Don't know actually. And we moved to a tiny little village in uh, England called Berkeley, which is in the south of England. B u r g h c l e r e. And it's like, if you look up the word bucolic in the dictionary, uh, you'll see a picture of this place. And it's essentially like countryside. We lived down a dirt track. We had like a uh, small field, like, you know, four acres. It wasn't wasn't big, but it was like, you know, some space to play. And I basically did that. It was a lot of outdoors fun and mainly consisted of trying to blow things up and film it and you know i had a little motorbike and like a tiny little twist and go thing uh a mate of mine lived um across the way and he had a that his dad had a beaten up old land rover defender that we would crash about in uh we would um saw shotgun cartridges shotgun shells in half to get the gunpowder out I still have all my fingers, but I don't quite know how. Um, and, you know, essentially, I think my sister, she's older than me, and she sort of said to me once, God, you've basically made your childhood into your career, haven't you? And it was like, oh, yeah, I guess I have. And I literally would spend, you know, hours and days just sort of, you know, setting lights, setting fire to stuff with lighter fluid because like especially in your hand you could pour lighter fluid on it and set fire to it and it, it sort of evaporates quicker than it burns so you kind of can sort of set yourself on fire and then jump off a wall or uh you know we had a uh there was a flat bottom boat that we tied behind a Land Rover Defender and drove it around a field and sort of like was sort of swinging it out and one of us would be in it and one would be driving and you know just really stupid stuff and playing with fireworks trying to make them explode and just essentially i was a big fan of the a-team growing up not the, like the movie that they remade but like the tv show that i guess it was early 80s was it you know george peppard or gregory peck i don't know. gregory peck not george pepper i can't remember who's in it but i always remember that as like you know, there was a scene in the beginning where there was a land, there was a military willis jeep that drove over the camera and it was just and then something flipped over and blew up or, and I just kind of wanted to do that. And I was like, that's that looks like cool. And there was a movie called Hollywood Stuntman, I think, with the guy who plays face, I think was in it. And it was all about and um I can't remember his name. It was all about something. There's a scene where they like put an American football helmet on and run into a jukebox and then they tie a motor tie a cop's motorcycle to the to an anchor. So basically they all burn off and then sort of they he tries to follow them and gets like the bike disintegrates it was just like stupid stuff like that and there was a scene in that where he said, oh you could write your own checks and i was like oh great that sounds like a brilliant job i want to be a stuntman um and then i realized my dad was in advertising uh, he was a copywriter and he so he had mates who were directors and producers and it was sort of always you know they would come down the house and so i sort of realized that there was this job that you were the one kind of like putting the creative vision together i mean i was too young to understand what that was but you know i was going oh, what does the director do and the stock answer was oh they, they have a vision of how how the film should be and I'm like, what does that mean <laughs> i don't know what that means and so i sort of but I realized it was a job that you could do. And I realized it was also safer than being a stuntman, but you still get to play with all the stunts and do all that. And I guess that that was sort of set me on my path. And um, we had a camcorder and I sort of used to watch these art shows. I can't, you know, I can't art attack or something, something like that. Like, you know, kids art shows. And one of them was like, a, um, they had, did a stop frame animation. I was like, oh, maybe I could do that. So I got the camera and I made these shoes walk along the frame. And, you know, it's like really crappy little film, just you're buttoning on and off for the edits. All the edits were like really jerky and like it was tape. It was terrible. It was high eight. But it was really cute. And it was like, it was funny. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day 
you hadn't seen him for years and we grew up together. Went, oh, I, you know, I remember you made that shoe walking video. I was like, fucking hell, that's like mad. But so I was always playing with cameras and I, I have actually, I've got a, a photograph. I took a self portrait, but I did a double exposure on black and white because my dad had this little stills camera. I was like, oh, what's this button? Oh, you can wind the film. You can wind the mechanism on without winding the film on. It's like, what does that mean? Oh, you can take two pictures on the same negative. And I didn't know what that meant, so I was just messing around with it and did that. And I've got that photo. I'll, I'll give it to you so you can put it up on the screen now. Um, and then I also found the um, the the setting on the shutter speed where you could hold the bulb setting so you could leave the camera the shutter open and like, oh so you could take pictures at night with a torch and i didn't realize i was sort of like messing around with a torch and sort of like these crappy light painting pictures but you know this was age i don't know eight nine ten something like and this was you know I'm, that was born in 77 so it's quite early there was none of this sort of stuff going on so i was always very hands-on with cameras and like i had a little edit bench and then i'd re i'd sort of wired up my TV in my den that had like, I sort of managed to wire into my dad's stereo system. So I had like sort of speakers everywhere and just sort of, you know, just sort of made a home cinema thing and just was always very into the whole thing of films and watching TV and, and making stuff and computer games as well, massively in games and sort of, but also running around using sticks as guns. So I was kind of like, my parents always bring up now a story. I I, learnt, I taught myself to drive quite early. So like, I don't know, sort of probably before, you know, it's like short round in uh, in uh, Indiana Jones 2, where I'm sort of like having to whip blocks on the pedals. And because we lived down a dirt track, I'd basically just take the car and go, oh, where's the car? Oh, it's just gone for a drive. <laughs> like, but he's 11, you know. So it was kind of like this sort of weird, weird sort of, mad free-for-all growing up of like learning just basically I now do for a living which is great there is another story uh where on the 18 they blew up a car using petrol that they'd sort of poured round the car and then poured a trail and I I as apparently the story goes I go into the house and we've got any matches or a lighter and uh they're like why and I'm like oh because I've, I've just poured petrol around the car I want to set fire to it because it'll look cool <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that was my uh misspent youth um but it was amazing and i really enjoyed it and uh it it sort of i didn't really know what to do at school i was very bored at school i didn't really i loved art but i didn't sort of i didn't sort of engage very well with you know i was very much a sort of square peg round hole sort of type but you know i didn't the, the schools didn't really know like, what to do with me so i kind of like was you know always in trouble and sort of not and nothing bad but just like just didn't do very well um i did work experience age 16 my dad got me a, a week on a production company and i was very lucky to sort of go to a production company and we went on a film set it was for a ski yogurt it's like brand of yogurt called ski and there was a, a script i don't know what the script was but it was something about a guy on some skis and whatever but we we're filming in this in the one day shoot we we're filming in like outside of london and it was an empty empty studio i got there early and like i was just amazed all these people came in all this gear was brought in lights cameras there was a man on a wire rig suddenly there was like people saying everyone knew what to do it was like these sort of this military precision of like how do they know what's going on and like i didn't understand the sort of mechanism of crew and delineate you know how it's quite a military sort of thing and how you know heads of department and different departments and all you know i didn't understand any of that i just saw this amazing sort of ballet and this symphony of like crew working together and suddenly there's a guy on skis and suddenly he's like doing this amazing thing it was like this incredible thing i just like this is what i want to do this is where i need to be because this is amazing and then everyone took it all away and it's gone and suddenly you're left with a white sink again and it was just like it was wild it blew my mind i was like this, and i was 16 i was like i've got to do this so i did some more work experience at 17 uh and then age 18 i 
left school and with some grades and uh, started as a runner. Uh, my dad managed to get me another week somewhere else. And that, so I feel a bit like a Nepo baby, but that was the, last, oh, the first and only two weeks he got me. And from that first week, that second week in that production company, one of the PAs there was going, oh, my flatmates, the PA at another production company, they're looking for someone to be a runner. You know, I'd impress them. You know, I'd sort of, I was very lucky. Uh, and so I went and interviewed for that and I got a job for four weeks on a shoot there and, and then it just rolled from there. But I was very lucky when I did that first week, age 16, that a friend of a friend had been a runner or something and said to me, the most important thing, you've got to turn up with a positive attitude. It doesn't matter that you don't know what you're doing, just be uh, happy to be there, whether you're making cups of tea or cleaning up dog shit, you've got to do it with a smile and do it with enthusiasm and, you know, and try and learn, read the room. So ask people what they do, but not when they're right in the middle of carrying something or right when someone else is talking at them, you know, sort of. And so I was very lucky. I sort of took that on, even though I was, you know, 16 year olds. I mean, I, what do they know? They're, like, they're usually idiots. Oh, I was but you know I was very lucky that I sort of remembered that thing that is like right just go in with that attitude and just be you know on it and when I was 18 and my first you know the first gig I got myself and it was for an amazing director called Paul Arden who had been this legendary art director in advertising and was now a director and it was a really incredible company very small it was just him and another couple of directors and they were busy all the time, so they were shooting all the time. And I was getting to go on these amazing shoots. I was, uh, you know, sort of, I actually turned up in sports gear the first week because I was like, oh, I'm a runner, I better run. And I used to literally run everywhere. It was like, sort of, like I just, sort of, such a geek and such a dork. But it kind of, that attitude of just like, come on, let's just smash it. it was like, let's do it. So that was amazing. And, um, you know, I, I also got to work on some really interesting creative projects and I learned a lot from him. He's got, he's dead now, but he's wrote an amazing book and I love the title of it. It's called, It's Not How Good You Are, It's How Good You Want To Be, the world's best-selling book by Paul Arden. So he put the world's best-selling book within the title so he could literally call it a bestseller without it being best. I mean, it was just like the genius of what he's doing i mean and that book's amazing and it's worth reading to anyone who is any who wants to be anything in anything <laughs> just read it um but working for him was incredible because he was he was shooting on film and you know usually you know he he was quite a sort of big deal in like advertising so his budgets were quite healthy and so you know rather than getting one light transfers of his rushes you know, they'd develop an egg and then they'd take it to a grading suite and they'd get a telecine operator to actually colour it and sort of to lay it down onto tape for the edit. So when the editor's editing, it's that they're editing quite nice footage rather than just like muddy one lights that you might get from, you know, the labs. When when they develop film, you just run it through the cheapest bath and it basically would, and they lay it down with a really basic grade on it. So because you're just doing offline editing, you just kind of don't really, you know it doesn't really matter but when he was working he would get one lights done uh, he would get grades done so it just meant that but he would never turn up so they started saying to me oh do you want to go so suddenly i'm turning up at seven in the morning going to grading sessions in like top colorist post houses in london have it you know sitting there and the colorist going oh what do you think i don't know, I don't know but i'm like okay great uh yeah i, I like that i like that and it was just a really just in fact you know so lucky to just be in that position where i'm like just having that not it was no responsibility but it was just just taking that experience on and you know i sort of like did incredible things at that company and like you know working on music videos working on commercials working with incredibly talented technicians from you know legends of the industry you know film or commercials and you know learning about creative process and learning about just you know when to push when not to how to sort of 
argue with the client how not to. Um, and, you know, then, you know, flying to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to go and collect some rushes or, you know, or going to a bank to go and get, oh, we need a hundred thousand pounds to pay, pay the crew because we uh, need to get it done quicker. So we're going to pay them in cash and we're stealing a load of them off for Phantom Menace uh, for the weekend. And so we're going to pay them on it. So literally off I went down to the bank and got like a bag of money and you're just, this is just wild. You know, it was like insane. So that was amazing. Uh, and then I got fired um, after about a year and a half uh, because I was smoking too much weed. I didn't really give a shit. And I was kind of like, I was kind of ready to move on. And it was like, so I went freelance and uh, as a runner still, and I stayed as a runner for quite a long time because I very much saw it as an apprenticeship. You know, I got to work with the best people. I got, you know, because I was working at a certain level, I was working on really incredible stuff where there was enough time, and enough money to do some really interesting, incredible stuff. You know, like a David Bowie music video or a, Delta Airlines commercial that was like millions and millions of pounds worth of budget. And you're like, it was, it was just really an incredible sort of education in, in just filmmaking and, you know, filmmaking commercials, they're not films, films aren't commercials, music videos are different document. It's all different, but it's all got a similar vibe to it. And I think, you know, they're different disciplines and you do have to learn each one of them, but they are, fundamentally filmmaking and and learning working with those technicians was just incredible um and and how old were you about 20 i guess i guess 1920 so do you finish high school yeah so i finished high school so i did i worked i did school until i was 18 17 18 which uh i don't know whether i mean i get very confused with the american school system so other people were going to university or college uh age you know you know 18 19 to 21 whatever and i basically just went and worked you know and i was earning all right money i was earning you know 200 dollars a day or 150 dollars a day as a freelance runner i was you know a pa it was it was uh it was incredible and i was sort of you know i was living this amazing life where i was sort of partying and having fun and you know probably too much fun but that was you know that was all part of being young and what point did you decide like how do i get to the next level like how do i start directing or like what was the next step like how did you progress from being a runner right so as i saw it as an apprenticeship because i got to sort of you know and i'm sort of getting well known in the industry as a runner and i sort of would meet the same crew all the time so i'd be able to ask them stuff where i'd you know even if you're just carrying lights or carrying lighting stands or helping a grip lay a track you're standing on it was they're putting the wedges in and just you're just seeing how they do it so i was i was like well i either stay doing that or i go and do a bit of production assisting or production secretary or i go and try and be a third ad or a second ad and but i i sort of realized that if i was i i wanted to be a director and i i realized that young directors first you know early days you earn shit money and i didn't want to start progressing in the industry where I was going to be a second AD or a, a production, you know, manager or producer or whatever, starting to earn better money. And I felt that would put me off wanting to then go, all right, I'm giving it all up to go and be a director. Cause I kind of, so I, I purposefully ran for longer. I was like a runner for eight years, but in that time I was making little films and it was a, it was the internet age it was just starting out virals were happening you know like you, so i was starting to do little bits and pieces i got a uh, managed to get i don't know how it came it was a friend he was a runner he was a direct assistant he'd been asked to make something make a short film for a band he didn't want to do it or couldn't do it and i was like yeah i'll do it and it was like uh this band that they were just a they were quite they were quite nerdy they were quite geeky there was sort of like lots of sampling and but they'd been picked up by a, a legendary dj on the radio called john peel and like so they had a bit of traction and i made them a short film that they wrote about how they met and how the band formed and it was like this ridiculous film about one of them meets one and then they meet someone in the arctic and they you know it was like this really stupid but it was an internet film. It was nonsense. It was kind of meant to be nonsense. And it was sort of the beginnings of what we 
you know what the internet what content is and i mean this was early this was before youtube so it was like it was sort of weird it was kind of like no one really knew where this stuff was going to go and so i was running and directing running and directing and then i made a music video for them and then which had a proper budget we shot on film and they had lights in a studio and it was terrible um i mean it was all right i looked I, it was terrible back then but now i look back on it and go oh that's sweet but it was you know shit. um and then i uh may started making i realized i'm not really music video type human i'm i think to be music videos you have to kind of play an instrument you have to be really like into and i was i was never into music that much i was into film and you know action movies and comedies and action comedies and you know i like lethal weapon beverly hills cop you know those sort of i wanted to make film like simpson bruckheimer movies i wanted to make i wanted to meet don simpson and jerry bruckheimer and make movies so i was like right well how can what what's that and internet virals were starting to happen and because i sort of had a, a sort of a background in advertising in terms of like my dad i kind of understood it i kind of knew it i kind of loved it um i i started making virals and like they were brilliant you know we were shooting on uh tape on mini dv the lenses were shit and we was like well how can we make them better we were like sort of putting rigs on for front of cameras and taking like you know spinning base like spinning like ground glasses and like having real film camera lenses on them to try and make it look better and doing lots of weird you know how can we hack the cameras to make it look interesting to make it look you know taking references from all these films and you know just sort of trying to but then if, then you're doing something like blowing someone's head up or like you're doing a real rug pull gag or like there was one i did for mcafee internet security which was about um stop unwanted intrusions and it was all about a uh, uh, a guy who goes to a psychiatrist and talks about his alien abduction and whilst he's under hypnosis the uh he's actually being um only probed by the psychiatrist he wakes up smashes her around the head and she's got an alien head i mean it was like nonsense it was crazy but this was a brand paying us to do this ridiculous stuff and you were like great you know they were you know ten thousand dollars and you know we got to make a little film and pay ourselves i don't know 500 bucks or whatever and night and you know this was the new case i'm you know but i know you're american so yeah. um so you know that was that was fun and silly and just trying to do more and more stuff you know trying to it was always this sense of oh i need to make something a bit more grown up and legitimate and it's like i look back now and go thank god i never did thank god i never made like some sort of we have a um can i we have an expression here which is uh i'll say assholes but we usually use the word uh you can bleep that um two cats in a kitchen um and it's basically like what most commercials are is like two people standing there in a kitchen talking he's like thank god i never made anything like that because it's like that's not you know that's not where i want to be that's not what i want to do and so i'm quite lucky that i sort of fell in just fell in with this bad crowd making stupid internet films for cool money but having lots of fun doing it and and sort of you know they were like live action cartoons and you know we'd have to upload them onto file sharing sites because you know like limewire you know because youtube didn't exist so we'd like sort of make copy the film loads of times a file and like give it sort of like names of pornos or like names of movies or clips or whatever and seed it on these sites to try and get it out there it was like this sort of weird wild west of sort of the internet it was like it was amazing it was a really fun time um and then i sort of started just you know i managed to do uh, a couple of car commercials like everything i was doing was sort of quite it was sort of comedic and it was a bit actiony and it had a bit of a look and it was sort of it was all quite so there was something going on so uh i've got a car ad and it was like a set of bumpers like these things we have on uk tv with like sponsorship bumpers but it's like 10 seconds or 15 seconds on the front and end of each tv show uh, in the commercial break and this was to do with the rugby world cup in france in 2007 and it was four guys traveling around france in a peugeot car 
uh, one from France, one, no, one from Wales, one from England, one from Scotland, one from Ireland. So all the four nations of the great of the United Kingdom. And uh, it was sort of these, you know, we did it like a road trip and did this sort of fun set of bumpers where they just sort of like, they were just stupid gags. And it was for a rugby audience, which I kind of understood. And it was cars. So that was like, I'd never really shot cars, but I got a great DP who knew how to shoot cars. And it was just this sort of like quite a human, quite lighthearted. It wasn't, you know, too boisy. It wasn't too laddy or sort of, you know, locker room stuff. But it was just quite silly and quite fun. And it was like, you know, just sort of sending out the, you know, so that was fun. Did that. And that sort of started to get me into the car world. And I sort of my career was kind of stagnating. And I was a little bit like, I can't quite. I didn't know what to do about it and I didn't and I was like I got to the point where I think you know I had to um I couldn't get a break and I was like I just couldn't work out what to do so I phoned up my old boss uh and I said uh well, how about me coming to be a producer because you know I was quite good with people and I, I'd done a bit of production and I kind of knew how budget worked and you know all of that stuff and I, he was like you know what actually yeah let's do it and I was like well I'm just doing a treatment for a commercial I don't think I'm going to get it uh and you know even if I do I'll just finish it off and then I'll just you know I'll call quits on directing and come and be a producer and I did win it and then I won and then something else came in literally that weekend and that was a Skoda ad, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But literally, that was the moment just as I was about to give up, it all changed and suddenly I was off. So it was, you know, mad, mental. So is that uh, Skoda ad, is that on your Vimeo, the ultimate test drive? Is that the one or is it? That... Uh, it's the ultimate test drive, yes. So this Skoda ad, um, it was for uh, a UK agency, but they had to shoot in. Prague in Czech and um, they wanted a UK director and they, but they needed to use a freelancer or something and I'd freelance at the time which was kind of unheard of for a commercial director to be not with a production company and be freelance but I was like so I was like no I'm doing it I'd set up a website and I'm like you know I knew enough people that I could sort of essentially just sort of get jobs here and there and I got this job and it was wild like basically the whole thing the premise is we take an actor or a person a human who is happy to be on camera and they turn up at a test drive we we say right you're going to turn up at this test drive and then we're going to make a film and so he gets in this car he's with the the salesman and they're driving along the salesman's going oh isn't it you know he's in this sort of like the sort of small hatchback the fabia and uh, and then suddenly they get waved down by a fireman or a firefighter and the guy pulls out the, the salesman firefighter gets in and goes drive 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 and he's like and my guy is like what and he's driving down his hill and suddenly he gets to his town square and there's a fire that there's a there's a, a grand piano on fire with a guy playing it and the, like the guy has to drive around the corner around the fire and the firefighters are in the back there's actually three fighters have got in they they stick a hose out the window and like there's a massive plume of co2 like fire you know extinguisher coming out and this guy's driving around and around and around puts the fire out and like he stops and he's like fucking hell and they get him out and he's like yeah what, what was that what was that suddenly there's this like pregnant sort of bride turns up and like goes quick quick you've got to come this way you've got to come this way and gets in a gets in a different car they drive up and suddenly they're at a drive-through wedding and he's getting married and like we're in vegas with like this sort of bizarre collection of people there's a really weird set of characters and then suddenly this sort of like big guy jumps out of the car and goes oh that's my bride you can't marry her and like suddenly he's like about to have a fight with this guy he again gets pulled through a curtain by these three japanese girls put him in this tiny car and they're like having a disco in the car. There's like mad music, like spread, you know, just crazy stuff going on. Pulls up at a nightclub and they get out, go into the nightclub and he gets in this other car. I mean, it's just like crazy. This is wild, right? And it's like this three minute thing because there's another car and there's a woman. Well, we don't know. There's a, there's a giant 
teddy bear sitting in a passenger seat and a load of puppeteered teddy bears in the back and she's like he puts some he, she gets some teddy bear ears on him and like basically he's now suddenly married to a teddy bear and these are all their kids and they're basically off to a teddy bear's picnic and basically like he's driving his car and she starts like giving him shit like sort of like sort of as the married you know the work the wife of this sort of like this poor guy sort of getting his eye did you do this and did you do that and like it's this sort of bonkers sort of like experience this guy's having it's quite, it's quite surreal and he finally gets to this like teddy bear's picnic and the uh the teddy bear uh marshal like parking marshal says i'll oh, just park the car over there so he gets out and suddenly he's in another car there's a motorbike crashes past with like this huge yeti on it and a photographer jumps in the car and goes follow 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 and they're in like in this sort of uh their little super four by four mini mini four by four suv thing and they're driving through the woods woods following this motorcycle and this motorcycle's throwing dynamite sticks of dynamite and explosions are going off this isn't like a train driver. He doesn't know where he's going. He's just following his motorbike through a woodland path with explosions going off. He's just had all this craziness. Go, oh, I forgot the band. There was a band of the worst band in the world. And like in the in an MPV and like they're all like sort of playing this terrible music. And I mean, it's just like this insane ride all the way through. And they finally get to this um, the limo and like this sort of you know very fancy executive car and he's in it on his own and suddenly the car starts to talk to him talking to him takes him on a relaxing journey starts taking him getting him calmed down getting him to trust him and suddenly they pull up at a brick wall and they're saying you've got to drive through the wall i want you to accelerate and drive through the wall do you trust me and like this guy has just been through all this and he's getting the car is now speaking to him telling him to trust him and basically so he does and he drives he accelerates into the wall the wall's fake and he's like drives through it comes to a halt and then everyone who's part of the whole experience like comes out and you're like you're reading this script going you know the production company going all right so which one are we doing and like the creators going we're doing all of them and like and we and i'm going yeah and we're doing it non-stop like a theater you know like sort of like interactive theater and it's like it's just insane sort of thing of of taking this person on this interactive journey where he's having just this wild ride through like all these weird experiences to do uh so anyway that was a big break for me in terms of like thinking i was literally about to be jack in being a director and become a producer and then suddenly that happened and not my career didn't like suddenly take off but it suddenly you know it was the first big legitimate thing that was like everyone just went what the fuck was that and it was kind of gave me a bit of it sort of put me a little bit on the map tiny bit tiny tiny little pin that just sort of helped me move up a bit um and i guess i got a bit of a reputation for doing stuff for real so i then got this script for emirates airlines which was a guy talking for 14 hours 40 minutes non-stop and i wanted to do that for real so it was like how do we do that so we you know we filmed it and when the camera would run out of cards or tape i can't remember what we we're shooting on it was i don't know but we would take a camcorder and film the loader resetting the camera and then carry on so it was like literally a non-stop performance of 14 hours 40 minutes and that was a website and that one uh, oh my light's gone off that's what that one it's gone back on i'm gonna have to turn it off in a minute uh, that won a a gold at Cannes, um, which some you know, which suddenly, you know, that was a big deal. But that was two thousand eight, and suddenly there was a massive recession, and everyone it was a disaster. So like, and I just had a baby, so it was like this sort of nightmare of like uh, amazing, oh terrible, you know, amazing, you know. Um, so because of the recession, I suddenly was like, oh, fuck, I've got to do something um and uh a guy this kid i'd been mentoring um he was like this super talented 15 year old kid who'd made a camera crane for his like sats or his gcses he'd like you know made it you know he was like super smart brain i managed to get him into um panavision grips for a week 
and then it got him into Panavision as a camera assist, you know, in a in the shelves, whatever. But he phoned me and said, Oh, Top Gear are looking for directors. You should apply. I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should. So I applied and I the guys I'd used for the interior cams on uh the Skoda job did the work for Top Gear. And I would also work with a DOP on a Lewis Hamilton thing who uh, shot for Top Gear as well. So I rang both of them and said, look, can you be my references? And I know you can't do anything, but can I get an email of a producer that I can sort of just to try and get my CV seen? Because, you know, something like director wanted for Top Gear. And you're, how many CVs are they going to get? Um, and because I knew those guys, I was able to... Uh, email one of the producers and the producer said, look, I, you know, you stick with the BBC, so everything has to be done properly. But now I know about you and you've got good references from people we trust. That does a lot for you. So let's, I'll make sure that I you can, your CV gets seen. So I didn't tell anyone at all, not even my wife. And I literally just didn't, because I kind of got this thing of like, if you've got a job brewing that, you don't want to take energy away from it by uh, uh, by telling too many people about it. So I literally didn't tell anyone at all. And um, then I got an interview with them and with Andy Wilman, the legend, and that is, and the producer and one of the editors. And it was it was it was great. It was one of those things. Sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop. I keep, I sort of keep feeling like I'm rambling and you're not getting to ask me anything. Is that okay? No, it's good. Cause I was going to ask you about Top Gear next. Um, do you remember like the first Top Gear kind of episode or like, did you do a segment first? Like how, what was the first kind of experience with Top Gear? Right. Well, it's really, so meeting them was fascinating because uh, in the interview, they were like, what's your favorite Top Gear segment you've ever seen? And I, I've always been into cars, but actually my favorite was when Richard and James make a space shuttle out of a Reliant Robin. Because what I loved about it, it was a build film of this, it starts with a bit of a joke and then they go, hold on, this could actually work. We could actually do this. And they suddenly get this massive ambition and then they almost do it and it ends in catastrophic failure. And so I said that to them and I think that went down well because they sort of got the, you know, they like that. So when I joined, my first segment I did uh, was Richard Hammond racing what's the best taxi in the world. We'll find out through the crucible of motorsport. So basically, it was basically a stock car. It was basically a, ra a, a sort of a um, demolition derby with taxis from all over the world. So a London cab, a South African uh, cab, uh, a German Mercedes cab, an, uh, uh, an American Crown Vic like cab and a uh, Russian limo, you know, it was like, it was just stupid, but it was like, it was on Lydon Hill racetrack and it was the first thing I'd ever done. I'm like, oh, right, okay, you know, let's get on with it. And it was great. There was a pipe ramp in it. There was an explosion. We smashed through a limo. There was like, you know, lots of crashing about, you know, smashing and bumping. It was, you know, we the drive. It was just really stupid and really fun, and um, I really enjoyed myself. So that was great. Um, and uh, I don't think it's a classic of the film, so I don't think you could call it that. But it's a fun one. Um, and then I did a power test with Jeremy, and I'm like, oh, you know, and it was with an electric Mercedes SLS. So it was like the petrol SLS and the uh, Mercedes uh, and the electric SLS. So I'm like, right, battery management is going to be a nightmare. And so I'd worked out how to schedule it so that like we could use the electric one and then charge it and then use the electric one and charge it. And, you know, and Wilman said to me, look, you know, he, he, he'll be thinking about that. So if you email him and tell him what you're doing, how you're going to schedule it, he'll relax and it will put you in good stead. And I'm like, I've got an email, Jeremy Clarkson. And I'm like, I've met the man once at a like, uh, you know, in the office. And I'm like, Christ. So I email him in and I just get this good kind of email back. And I'm like, all oh, right, okay. And I remember turning up for the first day at work on that power test down at Dunsfold. 
in this sort of crappy sort of porter cabin and what have i done i'm like gone from like being sort of on commercials with 200 people crew and there's like there's like five of us there and i'm like christ all right okay let's do it and but i've what forgotten is that my daughter had painted my nails i had nail varnish on so literally the first thing jeremy said to me is like you're wearing nail varnish and i'm like right well i can either just go oh yeah or i can just style it out so i was like yes i am and i sort of like had this sort of boldness about it and he was like okay and we got on well the film was good he you know we didn't run out of charge and it turned out to be a really nice film and i'm really actually really pleased that i still sort of look at that as a sort of it's sort of got some lovely uh camera work in it and you know it's got great grade on it and there was a army helicopter flying over and it was fun it was great and then i did um the hover van which very spray insane machine through the town and like disrupting everything and sort of like just sort of it was that was a lot a lot of fun and um there's a, a moment in that where we're doing some speed runs and we just wanted to do some you know we found a good bit of canal or river to a uh, good bit of river to sort of do some speed runs just get some fast shots like to you you know to do some cool stuff you know we were treating it like a car test so we were sort of essentially you know right we'll need a fast bit here um very serious journalism um and so we were doing this and there was this i remember there was this couple um and i don't know how much of this i should say but i don't think it matters so i'm going to say it anyway because i don't care um they had this beautiful canal boat this amazing barge uh that they'd spent you know load of money on and like you know it was like a second child or i don't know whether they had children or not but you know they had devoted their lives to this beautiful boat um and they had it in this uh mooring and they realized that we were going to be taking the hovercraft in and out uh, of this mooring you know because like when it sank we had to crane it out and you had to moor it you had to launch it off a I know more about hovercraft than anyone needs to know now but you have to launch it off a dry platform onto the river you know you can't you know if you sink whatever um and so they moved it onto the canal or the river that we were we were on and, and they put it between two massive iron you know these like steel iron massive sort of canal boats a huge sort of behemoth sort of things and like they're going that'll be safe there they're just going to drive past it once and never get you know it's not going to be it's going to be all right and uh little did they know that that's where we were doing the speed runs and we do the speed runs everything's all good and then jeremy's like down at the other end and we've got our camera boats and we we just hear on the radio right i'm gonna do one more and we're like wait shit, we're not ready and suddenly he's gunning it towards us and this fucking hovercraft he's like sort of like and two camera boats scatter like that but obviously because we had to gun it to get away we create a load of wake and jeremy just goes bouncing over his wake and smashes straight into this canal boat which is like their pride and joy and like he's like oh now who did that why is it what's going on I'm, ah, I'm getting, you know like he's sort of like getting very cross about the fact he's just smashed in something almost died you know he's like oh and i just came on the radio and went yeah but think of the shots think of the story and he still to this day tells this story uh that that was the moment he realized he quite liked me so that was the moment i was like i think i'm got a job so you were were you like uh intimidated by jeremy like i'm sure he he'd been doing it for a, a long time i'm not sure when top gear started or when he first started presenting like was he kind of like this big celebrity figure in the like the top gear world and were you kind of like yeah like intimidated in terms of like i gotta impress this guy like i i gotta be careful um, how I... I mean it, that's it's a good question and i think i was respectful of him i was very respectful of the what he has managed you know him jeremy J jeremy james richard and andy wilman together the chemistry in that bottle what they've managed to create and when i was coming into it they had gone past you know they top gear was always this sort of sort of uk show and push and push to make it as good as it can be 
I just don't do it with anger and, and nonsense. Not that Jeremy does, but not that, you know, so there are some people, you know, Kubrick, I don't think was a particularly lovely human on set. Uh, you know, you hear stories about, you know, how, how he treated um, the actress on Shining and you're kind of like, oh, that's that, you know, it, do you really need to do that? I don't know. And I still I'm think not gonna make shining, you so shouldn't jump on every single emphatic line. It looks fake. I'd, intimidated isn't the right word because I'd worked with some incredibly famous people at that point. I worked with, with David Bowie and you kind of go, David Bowie, Jeremy Clarkson, you kind of, even in Jeremy's mind, I think you go, all right, okay, I'll give you that one, you know. But yes, I was, I was, you know, had a deep respect for this guy and I wanted to impress him and I, you know, loved the show as a fan. So I'm like, I was very respectful. Um, but I think because I wasn't intimidated is that's why I've probably lasted because actually I don't take, uh, you know, I don't let him sort of railroad me, you know, like some presenters, you know, he, he's quite, he's a big person as he's got a lot of creative force and vision and, you know, he'll go, oh, we're going to do it this way. And it's like, actually, I think we should do it this way. And sometimes he's right and sometimes I'm right. And, and he's, 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 he, if you, push back, he will listen and he will work out quite quickly whether you're talking sense or not. And I think that's, you know, so it's it's quite a good, is it, I really like working with him um, because you, you can push it and he likes it to be, you know, as good as it possibly can be. So yeah, intimidated, no, but respectful, yes. And reverence, yeah, sure. So you, you kind of challenged him and just judging by like the TV show, like how he jokes around with his like co-hosts, like I guess that's kind of his style of like um, interacting with people. Yeah, I mean, he's he is a strong character and and he has an incredible creative vision. And it's about, you know, you know, who am I to say, no, you're wrong, but sometimes you know you're right and you've got to push, you know, not always and not, it doesn't always get, you know, and sometimes, you know, you don't push and it's about, I think that was the other thing about being a runner for so long. You, you sort of understand, you learn how to read the room, you learn how to read the set, you learn how to, the politics and the dynamics of people. And I think, you know, that's, that's our job as a director. That is, you know, so much of it is, understanding the politics or you know how to lead a team in terms of getting the best out of your incredibly talented technicians taking on their ideas and and going yeah i like that one i don't like that one or and also how to translate that to your talent that you know may not agree with you or may agree with you or are looking for guidance or jeremy doesn't look for guidance so much but you know others do and it's about trying to uh hold people and and hold many different opinions in your head and sort of try and filter it all out and so yeah i mean but that's that's part of a job and that's that's kind of a fun thing but yeah i mean the 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 atmosphere on set with jeremy is very you know he he does we call it taking the piss in england um you know it's joking around being sarcastic it's sort of uh uh, it's quite an Aussie humour as well. Surely you you get that, but Americans, you know, I I have to when I work in America, I I have to sort of temper my uh, uh, my sarcasm because like I'll say something and uh, everyone go what really and you're like no shit I'm like so it is sort of you have to be quite careful. But so Jeremy, you know, like he likes to joke around. He likes to sort of you know he is, you know, the 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 chemistry of the presenters is real. And it is, you know, they are like three mates who take the piss out of each other. They, you know, are this sort of like sort of, a, you know, they're ganging up on each other or there's two against one and then suddenly it'll switch to the other two against the other one. And, you know, it's sort of this very um, sort of vibrant atmosphere with them. And he, they're like that with the crew as well. And, but the crew have been Jeremy and Andy, Wilman uh, and James and Richard have, have worked with the same crew for years and years and years, and they have a tremendous loyal loyal crew who are very good at what they do. And you know they're the type of people that you can go on a thousand mile road trip over fifteen days, and 
you don't want to kill each other at the end of it. You know, you kind of are supportive. You're really good at what you're doing in the jungle. You know, you're you're a highly skilled technician, electrical engineer, building mini cams or whatever. But you're in the jungle and it's pissing down with rain and tropical rainstorms. But you're still getting it done, and you can still have a joke, and you can do the horrific hours and sleep in a tent. And he, you know, suddenly you're like, you know, you're camping on the side of a road because you're not going to get to your campsite or you're, you know, so it's sort of this amazing team that they've sort of put together and carry, you know, carried forward forever. And we've all got a very, you know, an intense loyalty. We're like a sort of dysfunctional family, really. We're kind of like this sort of group of mates that go on holiday together and make an amazing road trip film. But all while, you know, taking the piss, it's sort of, it's, it's fun. Okay. I'm sure he liked you because of your like practical nature in terms of you got to get the job done. Like this is the vision, like this is the nuts and bolts of it and your English sensibilities in terms of you knew the like how, when to push, when not to push. And like you said, like if maybe if there was another director there that didn't quite understand his like demeanor or like how to get along with someone like that, like I'm sure there's been a bunch of different directors over the years. Have you seen where people have gone wrong and maybe maybe you're probably not on the set, but you've heard stories of them? What's you know, throughout my whole career, you know, when I was a runner, I always used to work with directors who were, you know, it was the sort of late 90s, early noughties. And, you know, there was this sort of uh, late 90s, early noughties. And there was a sort of a, an attitude among directors that you had to shout to be respected and to be, you know, to get work. And like, they were assholes. And, you know, it was like, fuck that, I don't want to be like that. And, you know, you could see them picking fights with the agency because they didn't want to do this. Or, you know, it's like they're arguing about a color of a toaster. And you're like, Christ, this isn't, you know, this isn't art. This is you're selling a toaster. You're not, you know, yes, you make it as good as you possibly can and you do some incredible work and it's, you know, sometimes you get great scripts and it's amazing, but having an argument over a colour of a toast, like, please. So I've seen lots of, you know, directors go wrong when I was subordinate and I've seen, you know, direct, you know, when I'm working on TV shows and there's a couple of directors, you know, you do see some who work out better than others and, you know, that was the thing Wilson was saying in my interview for Top Gear is that we, we struggle to find a director who fits in. You know, I don't want to be flippant about, you know, how I've got here because I, you know, it's taken a lot, a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication and a lot of learning and some mistakes and learning from the mistakes. And, you know, it's been a journey and it's sort of that, that, that is something, you know, and a bit of luck, but, I'm a big fan of the phrase, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Because I kind of, you know, I really believe in that sort of, you know, I've been freelance all my life and I believe in sort of, you know, to go a bit hippie here, you know, is like, I believe the universe will provide you this stuff if you tell it what you want. And that doesn't mean manifesting, like, you know, there's all this shit about, oh, I'm going to manifest, so I'm going to be a director. It's like, no. What that means is you go out and you have coffee with people that you've met once and you go, I'm looking for this, I'm doing that. You you talk to creatives, you talk to people, you just, you hustle. And that is you telling the world, you're moving energy about, you're moving, you know, you're creating energy around you. And that comes back to you and you get a job opportunity. And it probably won't be from the people you've had coffee with or what, it, you know, it probably, you know, that's just, that's you just doing the work and just stuff comes to you because it's you've put the effort in and I really believe you get out what you put in and you've got to hustle and you've got to work hard and you've got to you know you've got to sort of just put the energy in and move it about and that that's really important. So yeah I'm, I'm just thinking about like in terms of the relationship with Jeremy like maybe he saw you as somebody that was, like you said, dedicated to the craft, dedicated to the story, whereas I'm sure there's other people within his circle or as a new director coming in, they're always kind of like pandering to what he wants and trying to impress him and having like underlying like some kind of alternative motives and then he kind of catches on to that. So when you say something like, you know, like this is, 
what I want to do. Like, that's fine. Or like kind of not really kind of sucking up to him. Like that's probably why he was like, oh, this guy's cool. Like he's challenging me. Maybe that's part of like you didn't have this plan. Like I'm sure people go in they're like, I'm going to really impress him. I'm going to like give him a, you know, Rolex or something, you know, trying to, trying to do like those kind of, you know, suck it, sucking up type things. So I don't know. When you get an opportunity like that, I think it's interesting because I was, you know, I loved cars as a kid, but I was never like, I guess, you know, I've sort of never sort of felt like I'm like a true car guy. Uh, you know, I love cars and I know which cars I love and I like driving, but I'm not, you know, I don't go racing in my weekends and stuff, but I love filming cars. And I think there's a lot of people might go there with the alternate, the sort of ulterior motive of, oh, I'm going to work on Top Gear and I'm going to become a car director. And, you know, I, you know, and I think going back to the interview when I was saying actually my favorite film wasn't three supercars going across the Alps. It wasn't, you know, a power test of a Porsche in, you know, blah or whatever. It was a build film, which is essentially story and, you know, journalism. And I think, I guess, that stood me in good stead and made them realize I wasn't there just to, um, you know, feather my own nest. I'm there to, I'm there to learn. And I've learned so much. I've learned so much from a lot of people I've worked for, but I've learned so much from him in terms of story and, and, and telling a story and journalism and how, you know, he always, you would say, words the most the most important thing of top gear you know you could literally put just put a camera on the wonk on a you know dodgy tripod and put it on me and what i'm saying people will tune in and listen and you kind of go all right chill with the ego but he's right and that's the annoying thing he's been right because actually the story and how the story progresses it, it's very much treated like a newspaper journalism story in terms of you know you've got to understand how it all fits together and how what you do here might have repercussions down here and that's sort of like a very it was a really really interesting education for me and you know don't get me wrong i knew i was working on a really blue chip show and i wanted to do well and i wanted to impress him but i wanted to do it you know what can i bring to it and i felt i could bring a slightly more human you know that's the thing it's like tokyo has been going you know i only did the last three Three, three seasons or something so um you know it had a good you know there's a lot that gone before me i'm like what can i bring to it okay i can bring some visual clout that you know i because i've learned some stuff in commercial world but actually what i can bring is a bit of humanness that i've learned from some of my filmmaking that i could bring to it and i guess you know just making sure that jeremy you know i didn't you know, I, I always feel that, like, if people are going to, you know, strong opinions, you know, they need to be met with a strong opinion or a strong personality. But you've got to do it in a non-confrontational way and you've got to do it in a way that is, you know, taking their idea and pushing it forward. And I think, you know, that, you know, I've always been of the opinion of, like, if I'm working on something, it is up to me whether I'm a director, a runner, a whatever I'm on it, on it, I've got to do my best to make sure that that project is as good as it can be. You know, whether or not that's just making sure the director has sushi at four o'clock in the morning when I'm a runner, you know, and if he needs sushi to operate at whatever, then I will find him sushi. You know, there is no such thing as no. And I, you know, I think I, my, you know, working for these advertising legends with these standards of like you know the cool sheet you know like you know that woman joe godman with her exacting standards or paul arden with his exacting standards you know his was creative hers was production it gave me an education of no is not an answer you've got to find a way to do it and you know you've got to exhaust every way of getting something right you know whether it's finding a a, a brake pad for a nissan sunny or in and you're in switzerland or whether it's a you know whatever it is you there will be a way to find it so when you know when i see people now and i mentor a few people and you know you can really tell the people who are gonna make it because you know just a few just their attitude to like yeah i can make that happen you know whether it's 
finding a good coffee or whether it's getting a piece of equipment or just a relentlessness of making sure you're getting it. And yeah, I think Jeremy saw that, you know, he saw that with the fact that I was a servant to a film with the hover van accident. And he saw that, you know, I was, you know, had ex had an exacting schedule and he saw that I didn't, you know, mess about. I like, you know, I was there to make the best film, whether it's a film about taxis or whether it's a film, you know, it's, it's a funny thing, you know, Top Gear isn't, you know, it isn't art, you know, like I sort of have arguments with people like who went to art school or film school and go, oh, you know, it's, it's just a TV show and you kind of go, yeah, but it's a TV show that's been part of popular culture in definitely in the UK and a select amount of people around the world, like select 350 million people used to watch it. You know, and I talked to soldiers, I'd worked with soldiers and, you know, Royal Marines who'd sort of been in Afghanistan on patrol and they'd come back in and they'd go to the mess tent and they'd watch Top Gear and they'd said, you know what, it it took us away from the horrors of fucking where we were and sort of gave us some lightness. And you kind of go, you know, it may not be art, but it's important work to a lot of people. And I sort of really you know, that really sort of made me feel good about that and feel, you know, it's, uh, I feel just incredibly fortunate to be, A, to do what I do. I just, you know, yeah, I've worked fucking hard to get here, but I just, I don't, not a day goes by where I don't see her and go, fuck me, this is, this, this is amazing. Um, and then, you know, but also to have worked on something with, with a show with such sort of cultural, permission such cultural sort of resonance it's pretty cool it's you know people watch it and tune in still it's on repeat all the time and you know i think that's to have been part of that i feel i feel quite honored yeah um yeah going back to like the the running running days experience like i think that is something that is very important especially to understand like the set dynamics because you know, people, a lot of them are technicians, they are tired, they are kind of repetitive jobs where they do the same thing every time. So if you can come in as a, a runner and give them something that they want, where it's a coffee or just like some lollies or like candy or whatever, like they kind of see that and they appreciate it and they'll say, thank you. Like this doesn't really like they, they, and if you can be there and ask questions at the right time, like you said, you don't want to be asking them when they're in the middle of something or like some of them are grumpy but yeah like you can read the room find out exactly what to ask when to ask it very practical knowledge i think that kind of that experience that you had like learning from others mistakes like growing up like at least if you jump straight into it like a lot of guys go to film school and then they go straight to directing they don't have the experience of like knowing you know, those guys on the ground that do the work and there's this kind of like class divide where it's like the crew versus the director where he's seen as like this kind of pretentious guy that's just, it's kind of like in the military where, you know, the, the officer went to a separate school and it's like the grunts versus the officer and it's like, you know, that kind of management versus the, the workers. So I think, you know, coming in as a worker yourself, like building yourself up the ranks and earning that respect. Like I, I remember, like, I think it's David Fincher doing Alien 3 and it was like the, in the UK and it's like the the crew is very against like a, an outsider, like coming in and they're not gonna respect what he's saying. Oh, especially young, this young director, like what do I, what does he know? So yeah, if you can get them on board and, and understand all the politics within that, you'll have a better understanding of how to kind of work and, and kind of convince others in terms of how to push and when to push. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I used to joke with people, you know, half joke, but, you know, I could just about do most jobs on set. You know, I, like, I'm not, I can't lay a track as perfectly as a grip, but I could get it down and I could get it level. You know, I can, I know what light is what. I know how to plug them in. You know, I'm not an electrician by any chance. But, you know, I'd sort of joke that, you know, if someone dropped dead, I'd know just about how to get around it. You know, obviously it's a joke because I'm, you know, but 
having had that sort of sort of grounding in running where I got to see all these technicians and ask them, you know, like, you know, when they're first loading cameras and I'm asking about that or I'm carrying the ballast for the lights, you know, I'm sort of understanding so much about what everyone's job is, how long it should take when I also saw how long, you know, I also saw the crew when, you know, it's getting close to overtime hours and they'd start to slow down a bit. So, you know, I've sort of seen it from both angles and I kind of, it, it really gives me a sense now of when I'm working with a team of what their job is and how they have to do it and what, you know, what bit of equipment do they need to do it better? And if I want to do this, how do we do that? And what about if we did this? I may say this, you know, I'll come up with something that's a really stupid idea, but is it? You know, like, actually, well, I was thinking about this. And they'll go, oh, hold on a minute. You know, I saw an amazing quote. Um, and this is mainly for writing, but it really resonated. It was a Matt Damon, Ben Affleck thing. And they're talking, I think it was Ben Affleck that said to Matt Damon, don't judge me on my bad ideas, judge me on my good ones. So that gives you the freedom to basically go, what about this? What about that? What about this? And then we're going to know that shit, that shit, that shit. Oh, that's good. Oh, that shit. But actually, if you turn it upside down and did that with it, it's actually really good. And so suddenly, you know, I think I see being a director very much as sort of being a sort of a, a leader of, of people of like, you've got these incredibly talented people, you know, and like whether a sound recordist or a DOP or a, a grip or a, or a gaffer or a spark or a trapeze artist, you know, trapeze wire, you know, human that, you know, swings people about or a stunt person or whatever they are, you know, it's about how do you get them on board all pushing in the same direction and like get them excited you know so many times you see people try and do it with fear and they try and like they basically you're going to do work for me because i'm going to shout at you and it's like that's bullshit i want people to do work you know because we all get into this game because we love doing it so you know actually if you go we've got this really exciting project and i want you to do your best work people go yeah yeah, I'm in, let's do it. And they give more and they give like, you know, and we all just work together and it's just a joy. It's like, you know, it's sort of, so I think, you know, I still get excited about being on set and still get that buzz about like, how do we, you know, going back to when I was 16 and see a white studio and suddenly, you know, everything comes in and you're making something and then everything goes away again and you're like, and you're left with a film and then you get to take it to the next bit. It's like, it's still just magical. And the magic is the people because generally people who work in the industry are lovely delightful charming funny silly humans who are also creative and 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 talented and you're kind of like what a what an amazing group group of people to work with it's like that's just great so yeah i mean it's yeah and i i think everyone should be a runner for at least you know four years because i just think if you can make a coffee with enthusiasm and then stand there and just sort of just understand what's going on, then, you know, when you're doing a, a food shoot, which is the most mind numbing stuff in the world, you know, five days in a studio filming strawberries fall off a conveyor belt in super slow. I mean, it's just like, oh God. But if you can maintain some level of enthusiasm and still be learning and still be watching and still work out where the lights are being put and where, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing, industry to be in it's just great i love it yeah and i think you went about the the top gear the right way because you know so many people and so many different iterations of that show have been attempted but they fall short because maybe it is a car show but it's not really about the cars it's more about like the 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 jokes and the people and like all the story within that that anybody could watch like they don't have to be a car fan to enjoy watching it so by you coming in and saying like my favorite episode is this because of xyz and then they understood oh this guy gets it you know and i guess that's how you were able to progress onto the next show like the grand tour i think you know it's quite interesting because a couple of one of the guys went from top gear uk to gun be a DOP in America. And so it looked great. Um, I think the chemistry of 
Jeremy James and Richard is something that is just very, it's lightning in a bottle. They caught it. And, you know, and Wilman as well is a fucking genius. You know, he is, you know, he is a genius. And um, it's really interesting when you meet him, you kind who's of... Will, who's Wilman? Wilman's the exec producer. And okay. he's been mates with Jeremy since they were at school. They were a few years apart at school, but they were kind of mates and they came up through tv together and andy was always a producer and sort of was like you know working with jeremy and um but he he takes the edit and he crafts it into this incredible thing and he is um it was really interesting when you meet him you go oh fuck, you're the fourth voice that i didn't know i could hear you know you don't you don't ever hear him on the show but he's like this the very much you meet him and you you understand the tone of the show is so much from him as well as the other three it's kind of so as a four that's where you know the 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 the, the creative energy between the three presenters and then wilman and jeremy as a sort of sort of creative driving forces and you know james and richard as well but yeah, it that is just it's magic, and you know, I think it's very hard to replicate that. And everyone tries it, and you know, they've done it in America, and they've done it with several iterations of like different UK people, and you know, it's not ever going to work. And it's also what I know is when they were doing it with Matt LeBlanc and Chris Evans or Chris, I can't remember, I can't remember who they did. You know, they would take an idea and go, yeah, great, let's do that. Whereas we, with Jeremy, we go, right, here's the initial idea. Jeremy would, you know, say, right, here's an idea. Or one of the producers or me would say, or, or Phil, the other director, would say, here's an idea. And we'd spitball it and we'd come up with draft one. Now, the other iterations would go and shoot draft one. We would end up on draft nine. You know, by the time we'd finished with it, and we're still changing it as we're filming it, because Jeremy's always thinking and we're always thinking. And it's sort of a different you know it's a different level we would take it to a different level and that i think has a lot to do with why the others don't work <coughs> the american ones also are too nervous about upsetting manufacturers so you know jeremy james and richard at their heart are car journalists and you know they are experts in cars they can tell you what the hubcaps were like from a 1981 golf or they can tell you know they actually know the shit they're not just rich guys who bought cars which you know chris evans brilliant broadcaster but and loves cars and has amazing car collection but is not the level of nerd that those three are and not the level of journalist of car journalist you know and crafting a car story you know it's sort of that's what makes those three special and wilman grew up in journalism i guess as well um you know so it's sort of that that level of journalism and that level of story is just phenomenal the the iterations i think that's an important point to make in terms of like you don't just do the first draft you don't just do what's on the script you constantly need to like uh innovate and kind of like make something new try something like uh, improvise like i'm sure it's very improvisational in terms of like comedy you know you can't just do the first joke you know you have to try to do different iterations of it and you know experiment I would always say oh you know it's so scripted and you kind of go well it's not it's like it's scripted in terms of like there's a plan and there's some scenes you know but the words aren't scripted okay fine if you want to all right we're gonna build a cable car in namibia or you know yes of course that takes some scripting and that takes a lot of energy and an organization to make happen because you're in the middle of nowhere and you need a team you know to help do that so yes there are certain things that are scripted but the best stuff was when you're on a, like a one of the specials like you know colombia or namibia or uh burma which you know was my first one and you know like it's it's how the story changes and how stuff goes you know suddenly jeremy will go oh i'm driving a I'm driving a massive lorry, the ride's terrible, you know, car journalism coming in, the ride is terrible in my massive lorry, I'm going to fill it with rubble and stuff. 
And so then you're filling it with rubble. So you suddenly you're doing a scene in the middle of nowhere and you're suddenly, right, we need to find a load of stuff to put in here. So we just stop and put some stuff in. And then late, two days later, we're trying to climb up these mountain windy roads. My truck's too heavy. I'm going to dump it on the road. So suddenly he's dumped it on the road. And you're just like, fuck it. This is just like how those sort of things those aren't scripted those just are sort of like but and you don't know what's going to happen but you kind of stuff all has a, it's like sort of building a jigsaw puzzle whilst you're on a roller coaster trying to film it and you know and keep everyone's morale up and i mean but they're wild they're amazing they're just like such a life adventure and such a lesson in just never quite you know it's never you know what how can we make it better? How can we make it more interesting? How can, what's going to happen? What's, you know, where, but it all comes back to journalistic intent. And I think with Top Gear and Grand Tour, even, you know, the sort of the most ridiculous ideas, like driving trucks through Burma to Thailand to build a bridge, or, you know, driving beach buggies through the desert, you know, they all, sort of were rooted in car journalism they all had they always was a why why are we doing this it wasn't just a i know it'll be fun to do this it's like no that's not the key that and i think that's what a lot of the other shows a lot of other tv shows whether they're car shows or adventure shows or buddy comedies they get wrong because it's like what is the why and top gear and jeremy james and richard comes back to uh, I always think it comes, and this is me showing off and being cerebral. There's a uh, a book written in the 1890s called Three Men in a Boat, and it's about three guys that go on a canal barge to find the source of the Thames, and it's three blokes taking the piss out of each other in 1890, and they basically talk about. There's this one passage in a book where they talk about fred i can't remember what the characters names they talk about oh he works in a bank and he sits there from nine to five and falls asleep at his desk and then at five o'clock he wakes up and goes you know and it's just like this sort of this sort of it's the same comedy that they that he wrote jerome k jerome wrote it you know 130 130 years ago and it's just we're doing the same thing but it's about finding that chemistry and finding that sort of why and what was amazing is that it was good family viewing. Everyone, you know, it gets gets some flack for being, oh, you know, it's misogynist and it's chauvinist and it's anti-feminist. And it's like, it's not. It really isn't. There was never any boob jokes in it. There was never any, you know, there was never sort of girls in low-cut tops. It wasn't, you know, car modding sort of girls in skimpy clothing. You know, we did a few, like, sort of things. Mainly, it's teenage boy stuff. It's drawing penises with like doing donuts and a sort of and drag races to draw a giant penis on a like on a causeway and you're just like oh god we're 12 year olds we're 12 year olds that's all it is and i think what was interesting is tokyo had a 50 percent audience share of women and actually i think what it is is because women are interested in what men actually talk about when they go out for a drink together they don't sit there you know going oh yes that girl's got big tits they talk about what could what could swim faster a horse or a dog they're like oh watch this or what would happen if i did that they're just like you know we're all i think men boys we get to age 12 and we stop that's when with that's our maturity level forever and then we pretend to be mature and we put on a shirt and we go to work and we sort of you know pretend to be very important but at the end of the day we're still 12 we like to talk about and i think that's generally what you know I, i'd sort of but you know used to say that i was a sort of holiday organizer for 12 year old men you know like these three idiots that want to go on holiday what could we do that's fun that they could talk about with yeah i think like a part of it like you said is the journalist like uh integrity in terms of like if a car's not a good car just say it like a lot of the like YouTubers or people that do the press tours, like they have to pander to the manufacturers because then they won't be invited again or they won't get the car again. So they're kind of like on this like knife's edge of like, oh, I don't want to upset anyone. I'll just say the car's good when the car might not be good. And then, 
you kind of like lose that, you know, trust. It's like, can I trust what he's saying? If every car's good, like, why do I watch this? Yes. Yeah. You know, and the, the presenters, they never took like free or discounts on, you know, buying a Porsche or, you know, it used to, but, you know, so Hammond would always go, you know, he's got a beautiful collection of cars and he'd sort of like, you know, can pay list price for every one of them and it's really annoying but you know you kind of go but you have to because if you were to take a discount your journalistic integrity is gone and that's you know that's the heart of it they're journalists they just happen to be funny and good mates and very skilled tv presenters as well i think the deal was done pretty quick with amazon and you know suddenly we were you know elevated from you know bbc budget to amazon budget was like you know it was suddenly you know for factual tv factual entertainment tv we had <clears throat> a movie budget it was insane we were like oh, let's do it <clears throat> but there was also there was a very conscious thing and maybe you can you might not want to put this here but very conscious thing that although we had lots of money we didn't want to make them look like movie stars. We, you know, part of the charm with them is they are an everyman. They are the bloke you go to the pub with. And, you know, yeah, all right, they're sort of quite substantially richer than most of us all. But they, you know, now, but they still have that quality that they can relate, you know, normal working humans relate to them. And if we started to like them too well or make them look great, it would just it would ruin it and it wouldn't be make the cars look fucking amazing and use stupid helicopters and sort of tracking vehicles with stabilized heads and do all of that but them we needed to make them feel you know keep them keep them low yeah and i guess like putting them in those difficult situations like taking them overseas and like making them sleep in like a tent or whatever like trying to show them that, hey, they're not in a trailer and they're not staying in this hotel type thing. I guess that's part of kind of keeping it low budget. But I guess you had a lot of money to go around and travel. But in terms of like equipment, like did did you get new cameras or more camera guys or like how did like the production kind of elevate from there? Like you had more money to spend. Like where did you put that money? Right. Well, so two parts to this. I think, you know, the the thing about what separates them from a lot of these adventure shows is they will sleep in a tent. They, you know, if that's all there is, uh, you know, sure, if we're going through a, if we're stopping in a city, we'll stay in a hotel. But if we're not, and the only way to do the route we want to do is to stay in a tent, they will sleep, the presenters will stay in a tent. And, you know, like Bolivia was one of the first specials on Top Gear and they literally were camping in the middle of nowhere in a jungle with like just tents they had and it was like you know that sort of set the tone for them and still to this day I know that they're, they're planning a, a grand tour the last grand tour now and they are camping for a lot of it because that is you know how they do it and that enables them to be able to go to really quite out of the way places that other tv shows don't get to because they are prepared to put in the, the hard yards. And that I think is really, really important. The move to Grand Tour was a big one because, you know, Amazon wanted 4K and we'd been just about shooting on HD and you're kind of like, okay, 4K is fairly new. And we, you know, we still want to be able to do this, you know, it's quite a large crew, you know, each, each presenter has a camera, you know, there's three cameras, three cameramen, there's three camera assistants, there's three people to put in mini cams for the cars, there's three sound recorders. So, you know, if we get separated on a long journey, you've got a unit with each of them and the story continues with it wherever they are, right? So, you know, and we, we kind of don't like to make a big deal of that in terms of it's part of the, we want it to feel like they're just, doing it and you know we want to keep the production very much the ethos is very much to keep the production sort of behind the scenes so you don't want to you don't want to you know reveal quite how many people there were so you had these bigger budgets now and there's one um 
thing on your Vimeo called Super Army Soldiers, where you go through a town and there's like explosions and they got guns and everything. Like, was that you kind of living out your childhood dreams? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was like, that's still to this day one of my favorite things we've ever done. Um, and it's very divisive. And I think that's good. You know, people either love it or hate it. And it's essentially a mixture of two films. It's a mixture of Black Hawk Down and a Tom Cruise movie called Edge of Tomorrow. So Black Hawk Down sold, you know, special force. It's like Marines in Somalia. It's an amazing Ridley Scott and um, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer produced action movie. It's fucking amazing. One of the best war films ever made. So good. Just amazing. And uh, then Edge of Tomorrow, a uh, Doug Lyman movie um, with Tom Cruise in it. And it's a war, it's based on a cartoon, uh, a Japanese manga comic. Uh, and it's about a war against aliens on Earth. And this character, Tom Cruise's character, every time he dies, he respawns. And it goes back. It's like a bit like Groundhog Day. He goes back to life. He comes back to life the day before, and then has to relive the next until he dies again. And then goes. So basically, we thought, well, let's do that. And we uh, did this this film in uh, Jordan, in the Middle East, at this special forces training facility called Kasotic, um, the King Abdullah special force i can't i don't know what it's called but it's like this incredible complex where like literally the world's special forces go like you know the sas the marine you know the marines i don't know if the marines go but the navy seals the you know israeli special force they all go and they train at this incredible city like weapons ranges like you can blow shit up you can fly helicopters about you can you know it's like insane so we were like doing an action movie for with but with these three idiots trying to do it and every time they they have to go they have to basically they see some special forces do the mission and they have to repeat it and they have to basically get a hostage off a plane shoot a load of people and like have a car chase and uh and get to the embassy but they're doing it under the journalistic guise of uh reviewing uh, cars in movies so the premise is if you're gonna do a movie if you're gonna do a car chase and you're gonna be the goody you should just get a faster car so they chose an audi a8 uh long i think and uh we basically you know we had a black hawk helicopter we had like them abseiling at jeremy like abseiling out little fast roping out this black hawk helicopter you know his trousers come down he lands someone throws a grenade and blow him up they start again. James May, they finally get, they land the helicopter. James May gets out. He keeps getting shot by a sniper. This goes on and on and on. So every time we're doing it, we're having to reshoot the scene. Now, this is full on drama scripted. This is not how we're used to working. We're used to working in a very documentary type way. Now, um, trying to get, you know, we had, I broke it down into scenes. I broke, you know, put all the scenes that are shot in the same place together. So suddenly you're shooting scene two, 28, 42, and 80, all back to back. And this is blowing Jeremy's mind. He's like, and he was like, I'm just going to trust you on this. So like, you know, it was sort of fighting, you're fighting. He was like, fuck it. All right. Okay. I, you seem to know what you were doing. Let's just do it. And we got to do explosions. We got to rig a car with squibs. We blew up a petrol station. We had like a, a run through this sort of village where all these people, these soldiers coming out, firing guns at people. We're doing a car chase. Hammond drives through a, like, he's hanging out the side of a car. He sort of, James shoots the hostage. Like, I mean, it's just like we'd storm a plane. It's like this insane 30 minutes of action movie loaded with comedy throughout all these lines that some people get and some people just completely miss them. It's just like, it was just the most amazing thing I've ever done in my life. It was amazing. It was great. It was proper childhood dream stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, you, you had the budget, I guess you guys just went for it. And then what about like the, like the Toyota Supra kind of commercials? I started working for a company in America 
um, we did a, a Toyota, the, they did, they did a, a road trip in three Toyota trucks across Vietnam. And that was really great. That was fun, but it was like three guys. It was like, they wanted, so they went, oh, you're, you've done this for Top Gear. Can you come and do it for Toyota? So I'm like, yeah, sure. Great. Let's do it. And we did this amazing road trip from north to south of Vietnam. It was like insane and mad and, you know, loads of mud and fun and, and helicopters delivering them or whatever. And then I got to sort of working with Toyota a lot and gain their trust. And I did a couple of things. I did one uh, for the Supra when it was very early on. And it was just a little feature video for it. It wasn't big budget. It was terrible. But we got to use Johnny FPV, who's this amazing FPV pilot. And he's just insane. You should talk to him. He's great. Um, and uh, we um, did this like amazing wrap around the car and like whilst... Freddie Asbo, this world champion drifter, is drifting around his corner. And it was just like, it was wild. And I really got friendly with the, gained total trust of the client. And the client phones me and goes, look, I've got a couple of cars. They've been used on the Fast and Furious movie. I don't know what, to, you know, I got some money. And I want to do something with it. What can we do that's fun? And so I'm like, I'm working with a you know, like production company and we're spitballing ideas. And we're just like, well, what about if we did this idea of a um, a marketing meeting and you've got the creatives on one side coming up with these great ideas and the marketers are shooting it down or or just saying stuff about, oh, well, how do we get, how do we ruin it by getting a feature in there? You know, they're not trying to ruin it. They genuinely, and it's, it's based on, you know, there's been, you know, there's been like short films throughout, like the past of like how you know people doing these sort of truth in advertising is a great one and you know like how do you know what how do clients and creatives and you know when it goes wrong how does it go badly wrong and so it was just a really amazing thing that i get to write this five minute film coming up with great ideas and then having a comedy dialogue scene of showing people how you know we've got this idea and then showing the idea and then the guys and then the marks is going yeah i'm not sure about that can we do it like this and then we get to show a bit of that you know there's i've definitely had it on on a script where they're going oh we really want to show a woman driver uh oh but we have to have a helmet on and you're like well <laughs> i mean okay but and they but you can solve that right and you're like well you know so you do get these scenarios where you're like you know, oh, we want to do this. Oh, we want to show really aggressive driving, but you can't cross the white lines and you can't show drifting. And you're like, well, but you can solve that, right? And you're like, no, you know, and like, it's very, it's sort of like, it's sort of, but everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah we can solve that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get on set and then you get in the edit and then you're like, you turn up and you're like, how the fuck are we going to do this? So a lot of, you know, yeah, it is quite real and um, possibly too real um but it was a lot of fun and i think i you know props to uh toyota for going with it because you know it sends them up making them look a little bit you know sort of making corporate toyota look a bit shit when actually you know they were the ones paying for this and they were the ones going yeah yeah what's interesting is when you're working with a car client you've got i think I, I guess I'm very lucky that I get to do car commercials because if you're working for a, a, a detergent brand or whatever, you know, the people who work, they don't grow up going, I want to work for a detergent brand. People who work at car, car companies like Toyota or Ford or, you know, Skoda or, you know, even, you know, sort of not even like the Porsche and the Ferraris of the world, the ones who work for like the mass market, they still car people. They're really passionate about cars. They've all got... You know, one of the guys that's here, you know, he's got this like this really old Range Rover that he loves, but it's always breaking down. I'm always sending him pictures of old Range Rovers that break down, but he loves it because he's just, it's just something about a car, right? He's got that passion for cars. So when you're uh, talking to car clients and you know what you're talking about and you're a, you can talk to them on a level about being a car guy kind of thing, they really respond well. So actually, it isn't true you know generally the 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 pitch film that i did the super pitch it's not that true because actually car clients are generally generally 
quite good because they're passionate about cars. So they're not morons and they don't, you know, but you do get the occasional one going, you know, where, and it's generally not the car client, it's generally somewhere in the middle, someone has said something and promised something that they shouldn't have done. And it's, you know, generally a, a an account person that has sort of go, yeah, we can do that. And you're like, yeah, but it doesn't, you know, it's quite a lot of people that don't listen in advertising. I think there are some incredibly talented humans, you know, whether they're the client side of things or the creative side of things or the account handling side of things. There's some in great intelligent people, but there are also some quite some people that are just sort of it's all bullshit and they don't really listen and they don't really you know they just sort of agree and blow hot air and pe that's how they get to their career and that's those are the those are the troublemakers yeah and uh, i guess because there's no agency involved there was no agency involved in that one um but so i've had my own production company and that was um i guess around you know 10 years ago or something and there was because there was a sector of work, of advertising work, where the budgets weren't, they were like, they weren't enough for a, a big production company to be able to do properly and to pay good money. And, you know, as a director, you go in, you work for it and you get paid one day rate and you're working on it for two months and you're like, this is insane. I'm earning like $100 a day. It's that crazy. So I set up a company to sort of do those sort of budgets and um and i made great money because i essentially was getting paid a day rate but i was also getting the company profit so i could i could basically give myself to the project for three months the project you know benefited because it had all my creativity and my production knowledge in it and i was able to you know do one thing for three months rather than like skit about the industry's changed all that work has now gone inside advertising agencies and they use freelance directors so you're back you know doing a one day rate for you know so i don't get involved with that because i'm sort of moved i've sort of got luckily gone beyond that now but it's sort of i think it's quite a dangerous place for creativity in advertising at the moment and you know i i worry for it a little bit in the um you know there used and they to be demand like a a, um, a few days around it, like a writing day and a prep day and like a week. Your castings, you've got to do your prep, your storyboards, your blocking, your meetings, you know, treatments are like 50 pages long. They're like, it's insane, you know, and, you know, you're getting paid $8,000 or £8,000 to do like one day, one day shoot, which sounds a lot of money, but if you're doing three months on it, suddenly that's not a lot of money. Like, what was it like working with um, Darren Aronofsky and like the Limitless Chris Hemsworth series? I mean, that was amazing and weirdly linked to Top Gear because the like is really bizarre. I basically, there's a woman called Jane Root who was at the BBC and she commissioned Andy and Jeremy's first Top Gears. It was Top Gear was a, a show, but she commissioned it. So she commissioned Top Gear. So I have to thank her for Top Gear, but I also have to thank her. She is a, owns a production company that did Limitless. And they uh, got in touch with me. I got in touch with them about something and I ended up getting uh, working on this show. And it's with Darren Aronofsky as the exec producer. You know, this is like the guy who you know, directed Pi and Requiem and Black Swan and The Wrestler and, you know, like has directed so many actors to Oscars and like, I mean, he's trusting me to be one of his directors as he's exec producer. I'm like, um, and I'm working with Chris Hemsworth, who's like, you know, Thor and, you know, one of the biggest movie stars in the world, you know, and Rush and like, you know, what a fucking great car movie that is. And, you know, all these things and you're just like, and it's for Disney and you're like, great, let's do it. So, it was, um, Darren was incredibly generous. He, you know, was, you know, he's a, he's a intimidating guy, you know, but he's also, you know, when he, you know, he was sort of not cold, but, you know, like sort of just at the beginning, it was sort of building that relationship. It was very difficult. It was on Zoom and, you know, sort of trying to work out, you know, and then he came to the first couple of, sh uh, first shoot, and after the first scene, he was like, 
it's all right, we're going to be okay with you, kind of thing. And I like, told my producer, yeah, we, you know, kids, kids, good, kind of thing. And I'm like, Ganelle, I've just been like given some sort of praise by Darren. And I'm like, that's amazing. And I've got to know him, and he was very generous with sort of helping me talk to Chris and like, how do I, you know, sort of, sort of make you know, just sort of what what he thinks a director should do when talking to talent of that level. And just, again, it's politics and it's it's sort of, you know, but Chris is a really, really lovely human. He's, you know, he's a great dad. He's a, he's a great husband. He's like incredibly like looking as a human. You're just like, no, you stand there and up. Um, and, but he's also, he's got his couple of buddies he went to school with work like still around him you know one's his trainer and one like works you know is his manager or, or some sort of you know manages his life essentially you know and they're great guys and they sort of keep him a bit grounded you know he moved away from la because it was sort of toxic and you know he lives in byron bay and surfs and so he's like kind of just like an aussie guy right he's just like a really nice human but he's also really smart and he once wanted to do something that was special. He wanted to do something that meant something that was like proper. He didn't want to just phone it in. So, you know, he came to it with a level of commitment where he was, you know, his diary is a nightmare. So, you know, but when we had a day, we had a day and he, he had him for the day and he was throwing himself into it and he was like properly, you know, sort of you know he could see that we knew what we were doing and that we'd bringing our level of sort of expertise to it you know darren brings a weight of gravitas like no other when you're an actor and darren's saying i want you to do this with me you know they're like going me he's like he's you know got mickey raw like nominated for an oscar did he even win i don't know actually but you know like he you know he's sort of you know he's got more oscars for actors than anyone so you know it had some serious weight to it in terms of you know it was the biggest tv show on the planet when we were filming it and we were filming it in covid in australia it was like it was wild it was it was quite a bonkers experience incredible experience i learned a lot it changed my life in terms of like how you know you spend three years thinking about longevity science you start to reassess your life and how you're living it you know and i got a lot fitter and you know just sort of this whole you know just i mean i've always had a very optimistic view of life and and want to squeeze as much out of life as i can but this really sort of cemented that and just working it was it was hard it was hard and it was you know it was a moment but i do remember there was a specific moment and i'm on a call it's on a zoom call in sydney i'm there my line producer, my series producer, and uh, we've got big wigs from Nat Geo and Disney, and we've got uh, Darren's producer in New York, this amazing, intelligent human called Ari, who's like just incredible. And at one point, Ari goes, you know, but Kit's the one holding the relationship between Chris and the show. And like, I was just like, oh, really? that's like, you know, that's like a, moment and that was a real moment of me going like shit i have I've, i'm doing it i'm absolutely doing it where you know i think as a director you 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 spend your career going oh my god i feel so lucky that someone's letting me make something i'll do it for nothing or you know like so you're so sort of like in this world you never quite know like have i got somewhere in my career and you know talk here yeah you know i've done that and grand tour i've done that but when you've got some Darren's producer going, Kit's one holding the show with Chris and Dis you know, just like that was a moment, and I, I was like, me, really? and I, you know, that was a real turning point for me, and a real sort of like, um, just you know, sort of a, a sort of a realization of self worth, and 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 sort of where I am in my career, and and confidence, and all that. So, you know, but it never goes away. All that, all that shit of self-worth and confidence is always a fucking black dog on your back. And you're like, Ugh. so, you know, um, hopefully you can be lucky to have something 
have moments like that where it just affirms what you're doing and and you know when i mentor people i always try and tell them you're doing it this is you know what you're doing now is better than you know is a good level for where you are and how old you are you know it's sort of so important to sort of affirm that with sort of a younger generation this is like a like a big thing that you can kind of take onto the next projects so um I'm not sure like what you have planned for the future, but I'm sure it's amazing and you probably can't talk about much in detail, but I'm actually, I'm actually been working on Clarkson's farm series three. So I've gone back to the fold, uh, which has been delightful. It's been lovely. And Jeremy's great on that. And he's at home. So he's like a delightful human on that. And, uh, it's in the countryside and that's a lot of fun. So that will be, I mean, that's in, that's, we're just about to finish out and that's in the edit. Um, and so I'll do a bit on that. And there's some other projects going on, but uh, I can't, you know, there's one I am want to try and show run, which I did a taste tape for, which is super fun. Uh, uh, and that's involved with sort of Marvel and, and stuff. Um, I'd love to finally write an action comedy because I think, you know, and do a movie because I see that I need to do that. I sort of, whether it's good or not, I need to actually just get one done and I've spent enough time about like you know learning how to do it i can now i think i can do it now well you got chris hemsworth's number now i'm sure you can i i texted him the other day and got a reply so you know i mean it's it's you know it's not it's kind of that's kind of weird as well you can but you know at the end of the day i spent sort of two years of my life with him really you know not yeah. on, all the time but just like you kind of you know i'm not in a circle at all <laughs> could be a, a Chris Hemsworth, Jeremy Clarkson, buddy movie. I mean, stranger things have happened. But um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And and just as a last kind of closing thought, like, do you have any advice for like people like in terms of filmmaking, whether it be, you know, commercials or TV shows or even like what they can kind of do towards, you know, getting there? Make stuff, make stuff, make stuff, make stuff. Film school, I personally didn't go. I feel you spend how much fifty thousand dollars going to fifty thousand quid going to film school i mean use that money to live get a job as a runner work as make some films and you'll learn more and watch a load of films and say yes to everything and do it with a smile and just be keen and just you know and when you're emailing people email them and be really polite and uh email them again and again and again but do it in a way that's charming learn how to be charming that's you gotta do that and if you can be charming on an email about going i know i've emailed you three times already you know but how can i you know blah 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 go for coffee with someone you know ask someone for a zoom just try and just pull it all in move the energy about um make stuff make stuff make stuff and be a runner and and create your own luck